Vernless Coupe was probably the first car that uh, really put my dad on the map that was built right here in my parents' garage. Um, and it, it was, I was young at the time, but it's actually one of the first cars that I, I really have good memories of. This car had people freaking out. The closest thing to it was Everett Resendez's Canterbury delivery. And then they saw this. They didn't know what to think. They didn't, they had true spoke water wheels. You come in with this and you go, wow, look at this, boy. And this was the start. This was it. Smooth cars weren't out at the time. Nobody was doing, nobody had evolved. It hadn't evolved into a smooth car till Vern's car hit. So it set the bar really high. Yeah. And uh, the combination of Little John and Boyd, of course, and Tom Taylor. Yeah. There would, what inspiration. Any, any real car yeah. guy, any real hot rider, street rider, <laughs> to look at that car and fully appreciate what, what you got there. And what a good job you've done of maintaining. Well, I think the direction in which Boyd was going, and he had started these other cars that were typical for their, their style, you know, the 27, the center door, the tall T that we were talking about. But it wasn't quite that Boyd look that he developed and was able to develop with Vern Scoop and Vern himself. The police kind of put him on the map. Yeah, for sure. You know? Yeah, and kind of kind of changed things for the industry there yeah, with the sure. sleek look, you know? No, yeah, absolutely. And then uh, right after that, uh, Little John, and we got him going on all the billet oh, stuff. Yeah, and all yeah. that, right? I wasn't there at the time when the car was built, but originally, um, in 81, this was like my favorite car in the whole world. This is the car that attracted me to Boyd. And then uh, years later, I went to work for Boyd, and uh, the car came back around 86 or 87, and I did some work on it then. And, and then just uh, this weekend, I got to do some more work on it again. Pleasantly surprised to see it back again, but all the way from Australia back to the United States and uh, ends up in my shop. Things turn around what do you, what do you know? I'm Gary Brown. I'm the owner of the 1933 Dernlow Scope. Um, I'm from Australia. I've had the car since 2000, and since that time, it's been in Australia. Uh, over the last probably three or four years, I've done a full restoration on it, and uh, I've brought it here for this for this weekend, basically, because a lot of older guys here do appreciate the car. Yeah, and that's that's why I'm, I'm happy you brought it here and, and allowed us to take it to these shows and stuff, because I think that there is a generation, as we've seen here, the older generation, they see this car and they you know, they can appreciate it, but there's a whole generation, sure. you know, I mean, obviously, I was there, but my generation on down does, I don't think, understands the importance of this car. This car still holds its own. That many years ago, and it's just, uh, I mean, 30 years, you, would, you wouldn't even imagine a car like that being built 30 years ago. It's the car that started what we would call the Boyd look. In the early days of the Boyd look, I mean, the less is more approach. Shave everything, just smooth. You know, my dad always said, you look, you start at the back of a car and you work your way forward and nothing's to catch your eye. And I think when you look at the Vern Luce Coupe, I mean, the car was built, you know, in finishing 81 and it's like, you can still do that today. You can start in the back and work your way forward and nothing catches your eye. When I was born, my mom was a nurse, and my dad was working a uh, graveyard shift as a machinist over at Disneyland, you know, repairing rides and such. Um, and, you know, things like the, the Fabulous T, the Senator T, and the Silver Bullet, those were all built at our house in Cyprus. And then, um, in 77, 78, we moved here into the Bonaparte Park House at Orange Avenue, and my parents built a garage back here, and it was at that that time where my dad told my mom that he wanted to quit his job and he knew he wanted to make something of this hot rod building and he knew he knew where he wanted to take it but he couldn't do it if he was still if he you know would still had his job at Disneyland so he took the leap and uh, started building hot rods full-time. I met Boyd in 1971 around January he was a blind date I was working as an industrial nurse at OM Illinois and uh, there was a woman there who owned a condominium. And in those days, condominiums were fairly rare. And I was thinking of buying one out here in Orange County. So somebody said, go talk to Anita. So I did, I talked to Anita. And she says, here's the pros, here's the cons. She says, one of the good things is, that she says, I have a renter. And she says, I rent the hole downstairs and it's great. And she says, too bad, he's too young. I said, Anita, you know how old I am? 
and he went on the date, and three months later we were married. Then Christopher, our, our oldest, was born in 74. And then the youngest came in 77, Gregory. And he was, he was doing this as a hobby in the garage, our front garage, our only garage. It was attached to the house. And uh, <clears throat> he started building at that time. I hadn't a clue. You know, when he talked about a tall tea, I thought he was talking about a new drink or something. I hadn't a clue what he was talking about. And then you start going to these car shows, and, you know, it was just him and I working it. Him and I, the very first car show we ever went to, um, it was his tall tea. I was 27, I believe. I hope it was a 27. And we went to the Long Beach, and he wanted to do it very rustic like. And he says, I want to get some hay, and I want to get this. And I said, Okay. So we went all around, had a little pinto in those days, gathered everything up, got the bales of hay, put them down. Um, and then somebody came up and said, uh, Have you checked with the fire marshal about those hay? Are we going to be able to keep them in here? And I said, Huh? He says, yeah, really, should be flame retard. Hmm, okay. Sprayed a couple calls, got nowhere. So Boyd and I went and got a, a spray bottle filled with water, <laughs> squirted all the hay and said, this is the flame retard. Well, they didn't ask what it was. They just saw us doing it, and we were cool. He won at that show. That was good. So Tell us about your 46 Ford. Oh, God, I love that thing. Big old steering wheel, big old body. That thing got me everywhere. I loved it. Convertible. I was even in a parade and carried the mare down. I, it was in orange. I really had a good time. And <laughs> I don't know what happened, but I came home from work and my car was gone. He sold it. He sold it. The man didn't even say, hello, I'm thinking about it. He did it. We didn't keep cars too long, so I don't think he really had a special car. I uh, think, you know, it, he just loved all cars, and um, he had certain ones that he liked to drive, certain ones that he just liked to look at and build for other people. One day when she came home, hey, where's my car at? What's this car doing here? Yeah, you know. <laughs> so, um, it's, uh, you know, it, it was cool. I mean, I saw a lot of cars come and go, but I mean, the, the really cool stuff, I mean, um, during that time in the late 70s, early 80s, I mean, you know, there was a lot of focus on just building the business and getting the customer's cars done. So that started it all. He had the second job. We moved over onto Orange Avenue, where I am still today. And he, was, he put a thousand square foot garage in the back. We already had the existing garage, but we put the second one to the back and that was going to be his workplace. We did that in um, around August of 78. He still was working at Disneyland, but he came in about a month and a half, maybe quite two months later, and he said, I'm going to quit my job at Disneyland. Um, why? Well, because he says, I said, can't you just stay there and, and just work part time or just take a leave of absence? Because I'm worried about okay where's the money going to come from because at that point I was just working the weekends and it wasn't going to be enough to support this household he said no if I use a crutch I'll never move forward okay not a problem he did it and about a year later I think it was he says I see a light at the end of the tunnel and I think I said I hope it's not a freight train yeah, my dad was always working, and, and it was cool uh, in the beginning because he was always here. I mean, he was out here at 5 in the morning. You know, the shop is just 50 feet from the house. And it was, that was this was at a time where people did have shops in industrial buildings, but most of the guys that were doing all the cool stuff, like John Butera, Pete Chaporis, and you know, my dad, they all, they all had their shops at their houses. And it was cool. I mean, I thought everybody had a... Uh, you know, a Bridgeport uh, mill in the back of their garage, you know, behind their house. I think he pulled on my strength, and I had to pull on his, and we worked together. And then you got timing. Here you're talking about the early 70s. Hot rodding wasn't the big deal. You know, they had those little circles and what have you. And he had a vision of different kind of hot rodding, not that dirty grease pit 
We're talking about the clean, nice, beautiful cars, showroom quality cars. John Butera didn't live too far from here. Um, you know, so it was one of those things where, you know, I, I uh, accompanied my dad over there and I look back now, I got younger kids that are at the same age as I was at the time that this car was being built and I don't know, I think that I, I see them as a little less patient than maybe I was, but maybe I was the one going, come on dad, let's go home, you know, you know, looking back now, I mean, there was some really cool stuff going on. I mean, you know, the, the whole billet movement and all that, I mean, that all started when I was, I didn't even realize what was going on. Vern Luce, he was, I mean, a man that just got out, an ordinary man walking out of his, uh, coming up the driveway, and he always had like a long sleeve, simple sweatshirt, and like docker pants and khaki pants. Very quiet, unassuming, just a, a really nice guy. There's a few things that stick out about Vern, okay? Um, at the time, I remember him as this guy, and you know, taller guy, few things that stand out were he, he owned a candy company, made suckers, loose candy company, and I remember he used to bring over bags of, of suckers. And I remember he, they were doing like a uh, little like Hot Rods by Boyd or whatever on the on the <laughs> stick. And, but I remember he used to give them to me and, or, and then he'd be like, make sure you brush your teeth three times a day, you know, make sure you brush your teeth. And you know, a couple of things I remember about him was he had these, and this is, you know, tattoos now are mainstream, everybody's got tattoos. but. He had these like cool like wristband tattoos that were just kind of interesting to me, you know. And uh, he he would roll up in on this uh, Honda Turbo motorcycle that was just bad. And I mean, I just it's one of those Honda models you never see now, but it was just some straight up just it was white and it was, it was bad. So th those you know those are the few things I do remember about him. Well, in the meantime, Vern Luce and Boyd and Tom Taylor were sitting down on these renderings trying to figure out a coup for Vern Luce. And the greatest thing about Vern Luce was he really, we figured out later down the road, he really liked the cars, he liked to look at them. He didn't really want to go anywhere in them. He, what he was really hot to do was have a place to come and hang out in the afternoon and see how progress on his cars are going and talk with anybody that dropped in. And I think because Bo uh, Boyd and Vern's relationship, the way they worked together, uh, Vern was easy, he, but he, he put his opinion in, what he wanted. Boyd knew how to pick it up from there. That was just Boyd, he, know, he sort of knows what you want. And he envisions it. And I think that's what started this whole Boyd Coddington look was through Vern Luce's. It wasn't one of his first cars. We already established that. But it was back in uh, the 80s, the early 80s. And then we, we've got this Boyd look, the sleekness, you know, the no, no handles, no this, no that. This car comes out, it's got a three piece hood, and there's no, no hinges on it. And the front of it's reshaped around the grill. And, on and on and on and then it's got a Gurney Westlake motor in it which is a complicated motor but Art Chrisman did the motor and worked things out so it ran and uh, it was also had a Bonneville influence and that was nothing anybody paid much attention to at the time and when Tom Taylor originally drew it it had a kind of a track nose on it and that was that was something that Nobody was really looking forward to seeing. Uh, track noses were, that was, a, that was a, a 40s and 50s deal. And this car had a lot of everything taken off of it. There was no windshield frame. There was just a lot of stuff that nobody did. And honestly, it was a, it was a collaboration between Tom Taylor and Boyd to come up with all this stuff. The body went down to Steve Davis and it was getting done and so and i come in and butera had built a bunch of suspension for a 32 sedan that he did some strange stuff to where he welded the body to the frame and uh uh stuff i had never seen before and you know i was trying to figure out how do you paint this thing so uh the body was for a guy named richard lovesey and he was from riverside Richard Lovesey, Lovesey 
had bought Tom McMullen's original 32 Roadster, the one that just sold for 600 and some thousand bucks. And it was in his garage, he had torn it all apart. But this yeah. was Little John's suspension ideas and shit like this. All these covers yeah. and shit. This was all well, Little yeah, John's. That started stuff. out on another car that John right. was building. That was right? Richard Losey's car. Yeah. Lovesey. Richard Losey's car. All yeah. those parts came from Richard Losey's car. Richard Losey, he and him really didn't get along. And Richard was pouring a lot of money into this. And John built a whole bunch of front suspension and Gurney Westlake motor and on and on and on. This was going to be a big dollar car. Well, Richard Lovesey gets in an argument with his dad, and he lives in Riverside. Richard shot and killed his dad, then went out in the canyon and committed suicide. In the meantime, I had called John, and I said, you listen to the news? And he goes, yeah. He said, uh, don't tell anybody where I'm at. And th at this time, Lovesey was missing. They didn't know where he was at. So John thought that Lucy really hated him because John had just insulted him really bad about a new car he bought and thought he was going to come and get him, <laughs> you know. Well, as it turned out, Lucy committed suicide. So then John called up Boyd and said, do you uh, want to buy some parts off of this car? And uh, Boyd said, yeah, well, what do you want to sell? I mean, he says, I want to sell all the front suspension, the valve covers I machined, and the motor, and the Webers, and a bunch of pieces to it. So they struck a deal. So I went over with Boyd, and we went over, paid John, brought all these parts back over. And I thought, wow, I'd never been around independent suspension. And nobody else, other than JAG suspension, nobody really actually built from scratch suspension. And anyway, I'm looking at this stuff, and I'm looking at Boyd, and I said, you really think you can do this? Have rack and pinion and stuff? Said, we never messed with any of this stuff before. And he goes, oh, it'll be, his favorite phrase, it'll be all right. Car front here, they came from a very special car, as I remember correctly. And it was, uh, very special kind of cars. This had an Art Crisman motor. Is it still got an Art Crisman motor now? Had an Art Crisman engine. And this was, I want to say Dan Drum or Sam Trout, one or the other. No, it was, no, it was Sam. Which one was it? No, Big Kitchens. Big, Big kitchens. kitchens. Big Kitchens. Mr. Chips. Every time he worked on somebody, chip stuff. I love him to death, but he was a chipper. <laughs> and changed the taillights. The taillights were trailer lights. We always put trailer lights on them. That's what they did. And it was just a wonderful car. <laughs> we went to Las Vegas one time with this car, and this is where the official thing started. Bowder and I were sitting there, and people were walking up talking to the grill. And we coined the free Bowder goes, look at him talking to the grill. So you know, if you have a car and you bring it out and nobody talks to the girl, your car is worth a shit. That's how it is. So Terry ends up moving out here, but he, he ended up, he did the final prep and paint on that car when it came back from Steve Davis and Dan Fink. And I think during that time, Dan Fink went off on his own. And poor Stevie, he was kind of like shop teacher for a bunch of these guys, Squeak White and Dan, and, uh, um, different guys that work there that are in business nowadays, you know, and uh, so anyway, the car comes back and Terry paints it and it comes over and then here I go and, and me and the, this guy Tom that worked there and Boyd and we put this thing together and everything I want to do, Boyd goes, no, wait, 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 you can't do it like that. Here's how you got to do it. I didn't comprehend what we were building. That was the problem. I thought it was just another hot rod, you know. I didn't realize this is going to Oakland Roadster Show and it's going to be this famous car. I just thought we were going to glue this thing together, get it on the road and have a ball, you know. This car, this car will be the same years from today as it is now. Ever, just don't, like I say, don't put no graphics on it, don't be ruining it. And this car had two yellow pinstripes here, if you remember, originally. And like I say, the idea with these cars 
was to make them look like a smooth bar of soap. That was the idea. No hoogie boogies on it. Everything that didn't belong there didn't. So we go to the Oakland Roadster show and we put it in the show. Well, naturally, it's the best clothes car there, hands down. And they come over. I mean, I hadn't been around anything like that before. It was it was quite a phenomenon, you know. All these people coming up and congratulating. He gets the Builder of the Year, and and it gets the Al Sloniker Award, which is for clothes cars. And, and I'm going, whoa! Look at all this. Good for you. You know, you're really on a roll here. And uh, uh, they told us at the end of the show. You know, if you guys take that back and cut the roof off and bring it back next year, you'd win the Roadster show. You'd win the Roadster trophy. So on the way back, I said, what do you want to do? You want to cut the roof off? <laughs> and he's going, no. He said, I got a call from this guy from Texas, a real nice guy. He says, I think we could build a Roadster for him just like this car and go for the Roadster show, uh, do, go to, for the big trophy at the Roadster show. And at the Roadster show, it's either champagne or lemonade. If you win, they love you. If you lose, let's get this piece of champagne. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody remembers who was second at the Roadster show. That don't count. <laughs> and I can't, I can't believe that we actually made it look like, if you think about it, there was a lot of similarities between the two cars. They're practically the same color. This, it almost looked like we really did cut the roof off of it and take it up there. So he goes up there, and bang, he wins it. So I said, well, what's the encore? And he says, I met this other guy. And this was for Jamie Musselman, this roadster. So after that, he says, there was another Texan that come up. And uh, or another guy from Phoenix come over and... Uh, his name's Larry Murray, and his, him and his wife, they want one like this, only want a two-door fan. And they go, holy smokes, you know, okay, it's not going to be red, right? Oh, yeah. The way I knew my dad was, um, he was a businessman, but I knew, I, there's several times in, in his career that where the customer wanted to do something completely opposite of what my dad wanted to do and it was it was a struggle i mean you're trying to trying to make money and build somebody a car but you're also trying to say you know you got to say no 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 we can't do that boyd was come out with this and all of a sudden turned the whole street rod the direction of the street rod industry from there and off of that evolved the wheels that came off of Vern's car or the idea came from Vern's car basically and put Boyd into the, getting started into the wheel business. So the Burns car had these kind of influences. It also was really the first big dollar car being done in the street rod industry. I don't know if he was outwardly vocal about what, what um, you know, this thing was gonna mean. I think he knew it and I, I, was, I think that he kind of wanted other people to kind of you know, realize his vision. And I remember too, this is fast forward to when Cadzilla was built. And I just remember one time my mom told me what my dad said. He didn't say it to me, he said it to my mom. And this was at the unveiling at the hot rod shop in Stanton. And he just said that, hey, he goes, people aren't going to appreciate the work that's into this thing. But the billet wheel was made by uh, Butera, who was Boyd's friend and his mentor. And if you ever listen to uh, John Butera talk about the first time Boyd was on a mill, uh, he says, he said that he had the, the way he had it in the, what do you call it, the chuck or whatever it is, he says that thing was slapping Boyd in the stomach. He, he was laughing, he thought it was funny. Boyd was a good machinist, he was. That's what he was before, but John got it. And John had made some machines, some aluminum parts, like he couldn't find uh, windshield post for a Model A, so he just made them, and then he couldn't find other parts, so he just made them out. He just machined them out of aluminum. That's what he did, and he, and he built funny cars before that whole program. So uh, that's how the billet thing accidentally got started. So John was good at building suspensions and so forth. So uh, he built. Boyd a set of windshield posts for the silver bullet car and then uh, Boyd seen some dashes and stuff and Boyd used to blow me away because I knew he could I mean he was running a, he was running machines and stuff but I didn't know he was really really good at it so there was no way for me to know that or anybody else 
So he would see something, and he'd walk over to the machine, and he'd just start making it. And I go, wow, that's pretty good. And he started doing dashes. And he'd, he'd say, hey, what do you think about this dash? I don't know. I don't like that so much. He'd go, get out of here. And <laughs> so, so uh, he started doing that. Pretty soon this billet thing is starting to catch on. Yeah, I think, you know, with what John Butera was doing, he gets a lot of credit for, you know, doing a lot of the machining of the first wheels and first billet parts. And, you know, my dad was just the one that just saw the vision in it and just said, hey, look, you know, let's just take it to another level. Where John was more the artist and, and uh, you know, he had, he, was, he, he had his way of doing things and it, that was it. And, you know, my dad said, no, there's, there's something bigger here. I just couldn't put wire wheels on the front of this coupe. That just ain't going to work, you know. Well, John had to deal with center line, and Boyd got a set of, that was one of the first sets of the center lines. And there was two sets of center lines being done at that time, and out of the three sets that were built, there was a five hole and a six hole. And uh, so I don't even remember which ones went on which card, but the six holes are pretty rare. I think there's only one set out there that were done at that time. There might have been more later when Boyd started uh, selling was a public. At that time, they were true knockoffs wheels, and there was a lot to putting those things on a car. Well, they simplified it and made them bolt-on wheels. So anyway, this all started from Vern's car. And frankly, you know, it's really funny because uh, a lot of times, no matter what it is, the first one's always the best. Ah, uh, you know, there's been millions of smooth cars done, but you know what? The first one was the best. You know, you look at the same approach that he took, you know, on the Vernless Coupe, you can see that all the way through. You know, you can see that through all of Jamie Musselman's Roadster, you know, going all the way up into the Boydsters. There's, there's still cars out there that, you know, try to mimic the styling of the, of the Vernless Coupe. I mean, you know, and, you know, the factory five coupes that they build right now, I mean, they're, they're built for performance and handling, which is totally awesome. I think they, they do a good job of that. Their styling, though, is, is that of, of what the Vernon's Coupe was. You know, people remember my dad as the American Hot Rod, okay? But that was really the last 10 years of his life, okay? Um, it's people, I, I want to tell the story that goes back from this garage in the late 70s all the way through the 80s and those are the cars that really put him on the map those are the cars that actually put him in a position to become the star of american hot rod and for discovery channel to approach him and and to put that on the air you know i mean i look at it you know i don't watch american hot rod too much anymore when it comes on but I remember I was at my neighbor's house a couple months ago and it was on and i just caught i just looked at it and i just it just was like, wow. I go, who in the hell has a hot rod shop that big? I mean, that was, a, it's gigantic. It was, it was gigantic. And you know what, I sat there and I go, you know what, I saw it go from a little two-car garage in Cyprus to a three-car garage in Buena Park to Stanton, larger than life, Wall Street, back to a little shop, and then, back, and then, and then the harbor there before, you know, when he passed away. I mean... That shop was huge. It had 25 employees just on the hot rod side of things, and, and uh, you know, it makes you appreciate things, you know. But I mean, that was that was big. Who's I mean, like I said, who's got a hot rod shop that big?